Well, peace, friends. Peace, My name is Tom Arthur. I'm the pastor at Sycamore Creek Church, and we welcome you here this morning to Woldemar Nature Center. This is a big Sunday for us here at Sycamore Creek because we are officially adopting Asbury United Methodist Church today. So grateful for those of you who we see out there who are from Asbury. We welcome you today. It has been a long journey up to this point today, but uh, God has been faithful and here we are. So. We are uh, starting a new series today as well called The Words of Life. We're going to be taking a look at the Ten Commandments. Guess how many weeks that series is? Ten. You guys are so smart today. We have some awesome music. We're gonna, you're going to hear, I hope, a relevant message about the first Ten Commandment today. We're going to take some time in the midst of all of this to ask some questions of each other. Um, speaking of questions, here's our first Connect question. What's your favorite nature center, your favorite park, your favorite garden in the Lansing area um, or in Michigan in general? And you're going to be thinking about that. Of course, the answer is besides Woldemar, right? Yes. yes. So uh, be thinking about that while we sing this first song. In your program that you came in was a lyric sheet. Uh, the lyrics will also be up here on the screen. And uh, the band is going to lead us in, uh, in this song. So I want to invite you to stand and join. As we sing about this God that we meet in the Ten Commandments, here's the Sycamore Creek Band with Holy is the Lord.
Please have a seat. Go ahead and grab a seat. Uh, join me again in thanking the Sycamore Creek Band. Thank you, God. So uh, what's your favorite nature center park garden in the Lansing area or in Michigan? My wife and I were just on a date night Friday night, went to the horticulture uh, garden over at MSU. The, all of the gardens at MSU, I think, are our favorites. What, what are some of your favorites? Just shout them out. Hawk Island. Young State Park, yes. Fenner Nature Center. We got the Maple Center. Phil Fulton Park. Francis Park. There's, there's a lot of awesome parks in the Lansing area in Michigan, aren't there? We live in, what is it, four out of five Great Lakes prefer Michigan? Is that the saying? It's a beautiful place. It's wonderful to be here at Woldemar Nature Center. Hey, uh, our host this morning who's going to help you connect with us is Gretchen Williams. Gretchen is our office manager. She's on the teaching team. She sings from time to time. I sometimes refer to her as our, my Swiss Army knife uh, staff person. She does a little bit of everything. Gretchen, come on up here and help people connect with us. I got to be real. It's the coolest nickname I've ever had. Just say it. Swiss Army Night. <laughs> yeah, so as Tom said, my name is Gretchen. I'm so glad you're with us today. Um, I want to encourage you to pull out your connection card. It looks like this. It's in your program that you found this morning. And you can put your name, your email, and anything else that you'd like to share with us right there on that, that card. There's tons of things happening on here. There's next steps on the back. You can volunteer to help us as we're going to be in, here at Waldemar for the next few weeks. Uh, so go ahead and pull that out and start filling that out. You can also find us online. We're on Facebook and YouTube. And um, I encourage you to, um, I want you to know that there's these buckets around that you see these blue buckets at the end of the rows. Those are for your, your offering. You can put whatever you need to put in there. You put your connection card in there as well when, you, when you're all set. You can give online. You could give at sycamorecreekchurch.org slash give. You can also do a connection card online if you really want. That is sycamorecreekchurch.org dot org slash connect and if you're a first time guest and you fill out that card we want to send you a book in the mail it's called you'll get through this by max lucado i think i actually read this in 2020 like at the beginning of the pandemic and it's still so relevant now we're getting through a lot of stuff aren't we so i want to encourage you if you're a guest with us that you can have that book for free now, if you're here in the, the worship space today, I would encourage you to take a selfie, pull out your phone, take a selfie, take a picture with the friends who are around you, and post it online with the hashtag SCCMI. Bob Trout, Nelvia, and Jana are our selfie of the week. We love those smiles. We love to see you guys on Facebook. So I encourage you to take a picture and post that online. And our message today begins with this. Nearly everyone has heard of the Ten Commandments, the list of thou shalt nots found in the Bible. Jesus saw in these commandments not onerous burdens, but guardrails and guideposts designed to help us experience the good and beautiful life. Words that set safe boundaries, create order out of chaos, help communities live peacefully and protect us often from ourselves. Every thou shalt not was intended to point to a life-giving thou shalt. These ancient words were given by a loving God who longed to protect us from harm while pointing toward the keys to a deeply meaningful and joyful life. Join us as we read the Ten Commandments through the eyes of Jesus. I grew up in Indianapolis, and I went to high school. I, grew, I lived on the west side of Indianapolis. Went to Ben Davis High School. Go Giants! I, uh, I went to church, though, on the north side of Indianapolis, um, and every Sunday night was youth group, and uh, oftentimes after youth group was over, you would hang out for a lot longer. You'd go out as teenagers and hang out, and... And then I'd have to drive home, which it was about a 30-minute drive from 
the north side of Indianapolis to the west side of Indianapolis. That shows you how small like Lansing is because you can get across Lansing and back in 30 minutes, right? But in Indianapolis, you can only get from the north side to the west side. And 465 is the big highway that goes around. It circles around all of Indianapolis. And one night as I was driving home from northern Indianapolis to the west side of Indianapolis, I'm going around the bank that it, like 465 turns west and it goes south. And, and it, it, it's, like, it's like the Indianapolis 500. I mean, it, it, it is banked because you're going like 70 miles an hour, like going west and then all of a sudden turning south. Except that it was late at night and I was getting tired. And before I knew it, I had dozed off going around this corner and I crossed the white line and I hit the rumble strips and the rumble strips woke me up. But I was going too fast at that point to stay on the highway and so I shot off of the highway, off of the pavement, over the embankment, there weren't any guardrails right there, into the grass, I slammed on the brakes, I, I went through a mile marker at that moment, the snapped the mile marker off at the base of it, it shot up in the air, it hit the back of my car, and, and I came to a stop right in between two trees. Is anybody like grateful that I'm alive today? Yeah, my heart gets... From that day on, I don't even try to drive if I'm tired. I will pull over on the side of the highway and take a nap before I keep driving. And, and today we are starting this series called the Ten Commandments. Insert Charlton Heston, these Ten Commandments, right? Um, and the Ten Commandments are, uh, are kind of rumble strips. They're, they're guardrails. They're white lines on the side of the road to make sure that you stay in on the path that is good and beautiful for life. Yeah. Behind every thou shalt not is a thou shalt for what the good and beautiful life looks like. Now, throughout this series, um, we're going to be... Uh, we're going to be looking at the Ten Commandments through the eyes of Jesus. So how does Jesus reflect on and, and continue the tradition and teaching of the Ten Commandments? And in your program, you found a bookmark, I hope, in the midst of all of those things, that has a simplified version of the Ten Commandments in it. And we want to encourage you to take that home, put it by a bedside table, um, put it at your kitchen table, put it somewhere, wherever it is that you will use it, and we want to challenge you over the next 10 weeks to memorize these 10 commandments. It's, this is a simplified version of them, okay? So we're going we're to make sure that we know the 10 commandments by the end of these 10 weeks. Now today is also not just starting this new series, but as I mentioned already, the adoption of Asbury United Methodist Church takes full effect today. Woo, isn't that awesome? And um, you may wonder, what is this copper pot that's up here? Like, if, if you're at Sycamore Creek, you've never seen this before. But, but if you're from Asbury, th this, is, this is, has a tradition. It has a, a history behind it. And it was, it's, it was handmade um, from uh, overseas. And it is a, a pot that they would take um, offerings, particularly for food ministries, from and so this is a symbol here up front today of something that's part of Asbury's culture, part of what is important and valued to the folks at Asbury that they bring with us today. Um, now at Potterville, our Potterville campus, we have, a, have had a licensed kitchen. We've done a lot of food ministry. Our South Lansing campus is more likely to order pizza or Subway or Willie D's out back. Um, but food ministry has been really important to Asbury and feeding people. So this is a symbol here today of that. And you might think, what, what does the Ten Commandments have to do with adopting a church? And I'm actually really curious about that too. Because every week I've asked each of the teachers to take whatever commandment they're teaching about and to apply it in some way to this Asbury adoption. Um, and, and when I think about it as a whole, the Ten Commandments in some ways are a little bit like going back to the basics, right? 
It's like, this is a football. This is how you throw a football. This is how you catch a football. It's, it's, we're going back to, this is the simple things, the ten simple things, thou shalt not and thou shalt about how we do life together. And in that sense, I think it's a great series for us to do this adoption now. All right. In our messages here at Sycamore Creek, and, and I understand Asbury has done this as well leading up to this through Pastor John Pohl, is we, oh, by the way, you can find that uh, bookmark, a digital version of it, at sycamorecreekchurch.org slash Ten Commandments, and you can download that and use it at home as well. In, in our messages, we teach them in segments uh, separated by some discussion questions. So we try to be really engaging, kind of a, a dialogue here. Like, I'm not the only person that God speaks to. God speaks to you, too. So what we want you to do is we want you to turn to a neighbor, and here's a question for you. What's your experience with the Ten Commandments? The good, the bad, and the ugly. And we're going to give you about 90 seconds to talk about that with somebody next to you. If you're Sigmar Creek, don't let anybody sit by themselves, okay? All right, so you may need to move, or, or, or there may be plenty of neighbors right around you, but... Here's your 90 seconds. If you're online, chat in the comments. We'd love to hear your chat, your comments. Let's talk about what's your experience with the Ten Commandments. All right, let's go ahead and bring it back to the group. Uh, you know, I think if I tried to name all Ten Commandments, I'm not sure I'd get it either. So I'm going to be right there with you with this bookmark, uh, walking through it over these next ten weeks. I want to just think a little bit about um, the Ten Commandments and the context they come in. Because the first thing we got to ask about is which Ten Commandments? There's actually two lists in the Bible, one in Exodus 20, which is probably the one you're most familiar with, but then also Deuteronomy 5. And they're just a little bit different, and we're going to follow mostly, I think, to Exodus 20. There's not any huge changes or differences between them, but there's little differences. We're taking some time later on to, to reflect, to look those up. Um, the Ten Commandments, particularly the Exodus set, comes from the 15th to 14th century B.C., when the Israelites are being led out of slavery in Egypt into freedom and into the promised land. And, and you all are, are probably familiar with this. This is sort of the map of you've got the Arabian Peninsula and Egypt off to the left here. And, and they cross the Red Sea. And, and that's, you know, you can imagine Charlton Heston and the seas parting. And, and, and then they wander around in the Arabian desert for 40 years. And eventually they make it into the promised land uh, after everybody has died who came from Egypt, except for Joshua and Caleb. Uh, so you've got, you've got this happening. And actually, I had the chance to go and, and experience this area of the Middle East when I was in seminary in 2007. Um, we had a chance to hang out at a resort on the Red Sea. So there you can kind of see the, the feel of this. Um, we climbed up uh, Mount Sinai, or re nobody really actually knows where Mount Sinai is, but, but this was a good, good picture of it. You could either hike up or you could take a camel up. And for some reason, I decided to take a camel, which was an experience I never need to have again. <laughs> hike up Mount Sinai, don't take the camel. 
we, we got up there before the sun rose and Christians were gathered from all over the world at the top of this mountain and Christians from every tribe and every nation and every language and they were singing and they were praying and it was like a little foretaste of what heaven is going to be like. Heaven's not going to be all white people all singing, uh, speaking English, right? Like it's going to be every tribe, every nation, every tongue at the top of Mount Sinai. And, and then we watched the sun come up. And, and it's from this very spot that I took this picture that Charlton Heston said, These Ten Commandments. Okay, not really. So the first commandment, um, depending on who you ask, the Jews or Christians, um, Protestants, is either going to be, the Jews say, this is the first of the Ten Commandments. I am Yahweh, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. That's interesting to think of that as the first commandment, right? And that's what the Jewish tradition has. But the, the Christian tradition looks more to the second phrase of this sentence. You shall have no other gods before me. Now the name of this God, if you're going to ask, well, what other, if you shouldn't have any other gods, well, what is this God? And, and the name that we get in this passage is Yahweh, and it's actually Hebrew uses Y-H-W-H, and, and the Hebrew doesn't put the vowels in it, it just has the consonants. So you have to kind of know what the vowels are that go in there. Sometimes that's transliterated in the English into Yahweh, like it is here in the NRSV, or sometimes it's transliterated as Jehovah. And, and Y-H-W-H is, uh, literally means uh, to be. So it's as if God is saying that God's name is I am who I am. I am to be who I am to be. I will be who I will be. And, and that should all sound familiar to those of us who grew up in Sunday school or who, um, who have any familiarity with the biblical story because Moses heard this first name of God for the first time as he is as he's walking through the desert and there's a bush that's on fire but it's not being consumed and all of a sudden the bush starts speaking to him and he's starting to wonder am I on a trip or is this really God and it turns out that it is God and God tells Moses to go back to Egypt and to, to lead the Israelites out of slavery and into freedom and, and of course, in Egypt, uh, the Egyptians and the Israelites worshipped all kinds of gods. And so Moses says, well, which god should I say sent me? Like, wh who are we talking about here? And God says, tell them that Yahweh, I am, sent you. I will be who I will be. I am beingness. I am God. Now, you don't often see this uh, in a lot of our Bibles because Yahweh, or YHWH, gets translated because of sort of the sacredness of God's name, particularly in the Jewish tradition, into the phrase, the Lord. And it's usually in all caps in your Bibles. And so if you're reading along in your Bible and you see the Lord in all caps, know that behind that is this name of God, Yahweh. And it's in all kinds of places. For example, places that you're familiar with. In fact, over 6,400 places. Think about Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. That's Yahweh is my shepherd. Or think about the, the, the most important commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength from Deuteronomy 6, 4. This is often referred to as the Shema in the Jewish tradition. Of it's, you shall love Yahweh. And then you think about Micah 6, 8. What does Yahweh, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God? These are all places where Yahweh, where God is saying, I am being. Everything that exists and everything that is that derives its existence from me, that is the God that is speaking to you. I am the source and the sustainer of everything. From the smallest of quarks and neurons or uh, nuons and protons and electrons and atoms and molecules, all the way to the moons and planets and stars and and, and universes, the whole galaxy, this is the God that we worship. And when we may understand that everything that exists and continues to exist because of God, the only appropriate response is, thank you. Thank you, God. 
to praise God. The first commandment, it summarizes everything about all of life. Everything that you need to know about God. And, and everything else in the Bible is commentary on this first commandment. Sometimes scientists think about this, this phrase called the theory of everything, which also happens to be a really great movie about Stephen Hawking, if you haven't seen it. Um, I cried through the whole thing, by the way, but that's not unusual for me with movies. Um, <laughs> The, the theory of everything is the, the basic idea that, math, that scientists are looking for is, is a simple math equation that explains everything. That explains everything. And, and I think when you look at that idea from a Christian perspective, what you come to realize is that Yahweh is the theory of everything. Is the theory of everything. Epimenides, the 6th century Greek philosopher, he was talking about Zeus when he said, in him we live and move and have our being. Um, and, and interestingly enough, that should sound familiar, right? It, it, because the Apostle Paul, the first missionary of the church, the author of many of the books of the Bible, quotes Epimenides in the book of Acts. He says, for in God we live and move and have our being, and as some of your poets have said. And now you know the poet that said that it was Epimenides. Paul Tillich, the mid-20th century theologian, German theologian who eventually left Nazi Germany to come live in America referred to God as the ground of all being. The ground of all being. So I told you the only appropriate response is praise and thanksgiving, right? And, and Psalm 150, the last psalm in the prayer book of the Bible, ends with this idea, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Everything has breath. All right, this brings us to our second question because I've given you a whole bunch of ideas about who God is or what phrases come to mind when I think about God. But I wonder what comes to mind, what do you think about when, when you think about God? What phrase comes to mind? Who is God to you? Let, let's take some time to talk about that. So we got some comments on Facebook. Uh, Aaron Umstead says, God is love. Casey Ann says, unconditional love and grace. Teresa Miller, who's in the room and also on Facebook, says, God knows all things. If God is the theory of everything, then we think about that first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. I mean, why would you? Because God is the theory. God is everything. How could you have any God besides God? Now, most of us, we're probably not out there worshiping Odin or Zeus or Baal or these sort of mythological figures in, in our history. Um, but today we want to think about this maybe a, maybe a little more metaphorically. What, what is it the thing, what, what drives you? What gets you up in the morning? What do you devote all of your resources, your time and your energy to? The, these can become gods. Anything that begins to take the place of God in your life, that you start to put first, 
that can become your God. I mean, even good things, things that are good, that are not in their right order or proportion or priority, they can become God's to you. And, and if we think about this commandment from that perspective, we struggle with this all the time. All the time. Let's think about what some of those might be. I mean, one of them in our culture, I think, is wealth and money. Um, money can be neutral. It, it can do a lot of good. It can also do a lot of damage. Uh, the Bible talks about money as the root of all kinds of evil. Sometimes that gets misquoted as the root of all evil. It's not the root of all evil, um, but it is the root of all kinds of evil. If we take this thing that is meant to serve others um, and, and we hoard it and, and we act out of greed, then it, it becomes a God to us. Comes God. Jesus talking about a, the, a parable. He's talking about a parable of a farmer who goes and, and, and throws some seed over here and throws some seed over here. And some of the seed falls in, in thorns and thistles and rocks and, and it, it, it grows up and they choke out the, the, uh, the, the food or the thing that's being planted. And a little bit later on, the disciples asked Jesus, what was that about? And he says, well, the thorns and the thistles, those are the cares of this world. They're the the accumulation of wealth, the, the, all of those things, they choke out the good and the beautiful that the Ten Commandments put us on. Um, I, I think back to in 1864 is when the United States first started to put on our coins this phrase, in God we trust. And I think that was our attempt to say, listen, we're not going to trust first and foremost in money. We're going to trust first and foremost in God. But I'm not sure that that has ever been anything more than aspirational for us. It's, it's as if we, we had to put it on there to trick ourselves into saying we don't really trust in this. Because if I'm really honest about myself, um, I trust a lot in my paycheck. And I trust a lot in my pension fund that I'm putting money into. There's a lot of trust. Do I put my trust in those things before I put my trust in God? If so... You are over the rumble strips, and we need to get back on to the good and the beautiful life. Uh, another thing I think that can drive us is, uh, in our culture um, is, uh, is sex. And sex can be beautiful, and it can be good and in, in the right context, in a safe and, and healthy and lifelong commitment between two people. It can be a beautiful thing that brings life into this world, that, that bonds you together in intimacy. The Bible talks about, about sex as creating one flesh. And, and I think about when sometimes I'm using duct tape and I accidentally like fold the duct tape in on itself and, and the two sticky sides stick together. What, what, that duct tape, which was two pieces, has become one piece, right? You're not using it at all anymore as individual pieces. Sex binds us together in intimacy like that. That can be beautiful. But the problem is when the, the, the means become the ends. And in our culture, we are so driven by sex that we have put it as the number one thing. What do you trust in? What drives you? What gets you up in the morning? And if we put sex in that place, then we are off the rumble strips, over the white line, through the guardrails, and we need to get back into the beautiful and good life that the Ten Commandments describes. Uh, another thing I think that, that can be an idol in our life that can drive us is power. Now, power is a neutral thing. It can be used for great good, or it can be used for great harm. And, and this is something I struggle with as a pastor. You all invest a lot of power and authority in the office of the pastor at Sycamore Creek. And one thing I know is that in the midst of that, it's very easy to start to hold on to it and try to pull it in to yourself rather than to constantly be using it and giving it away. We all know the phrase, right, that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, another thing I think that can become an idol that we sometimes forget about are the people in our lives. We can turn our spouse into an idol. We can turn our children into idols, our grandkids into idols. 
when what's driving you in the morning? I mean, these are beautiful things. Kids are wonderful most of the time. Grandkids are wonderful 100% of the time. But do you put God before you put them? This series is based on a series uh, by Adam Hamilton from Church of the Resurrection in Kansas City. And one of the things that he says that he did with his kids that challenged me was he said that he prayed for them before they were married that their future spouse would love God before they loved his children. I thought that's such a powerful prayer. And also to pray for our children and our grandkids that they would love God before they, they would put God first before they even put their spouse or their future kids People can become an idol, and when they do, we're over the rumble strips and the white line and away from the good and the beautiful life that God has for us. So what drives you? What's the deeper thing underneath everything? What are you serving with your time and your talent and your resources? Think back to the garden and Adam and Eve and what the first temptation to them is if you eat this fruit, you will be like God. And, and, and that's like when our pride and our ego get in the way. Ego can be an acronym for edging God out. At which point, when, 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 when our ego and our pride gets in the way, it ruins everything else around us. It ruins our kids, it ruins our spouses, it ruins our church, it ruins our life. And we are over the rumble strips over the, the guardrails and away from the good and the beautiful life that God has for us together. But the first commandment keeps us on that good and beautiful path. That when it's about God, then everything else is second and in its proper place. So we're going to go a little deep with a final chat question in this message. Name one thing that you tend to rely upon more than you rely upon God. What's something you're tempted to? Write that in the comments section or turn to your neighbor. And then after you talk about that, we're going to come back and reflect a little bit on this from Jesus' perspective and apply this to our adoption. But turn to your neighbor. Let's talk about this for 90 seconds. We got some good answers coming in online. Uh, money and food. Yikes! My job. Here's a really insightful one. A day at home with nowhere to go is what drives me through the work week. <laughs> Amen for that. But we, we can put that before God. That's a good and beautiful thing. But if we put it before God, we're over the rumble strips rather than in the good and the beautiful. Now, as we think about the, this commandment through the eyes of Jesus... Jesus, interestingly, never quotes the first commandment. He never quotes it directly, but he talks about it all the time. When he's asked, what's the greatest commandment? He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength. You'll love all. Oh, he's quoting, of course, Deuteronomy 6.4. In, in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you 
as well. When, when he teaches his disciples how to pray, he says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, not my kingdom. Your will be done, not my will. And then when he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, which is maybe his favorite nature center, his favorite garden, park, but just, just a day before he's going to go through this execution and crucifixion, he prays to God, Father, God, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done, yours be done. Jesus talks about this commandment in everything that he does and, and as we adopt Asbury United Methodist Church, uh, I, I think about this question. What's at the center of your church? What's at the center of our church, friends? Is it a particular way of doing church, as good as that may be? Is it a preference that you have for a kind of music or a kind of seating or a kind of location? Or is it the purposes of God? What's at the center of your church? What's at the center of our church? If you're someone who leans a little more liking or preferencing tradition, tradition can become an idol. I've heard it said that tradition at its best is the living faith of the dead, and traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. But here's, the, here's another side of that. We here at Sycamore Creek like to be creative. And being creative can become an idol too. When the means becomes the end rather than God. As, as we were doing this, um, we always do a sermon preview. And there's a couple people who listen to this before we get up here. You know, they, somebody pays for the sermon. Either the, the pastor in preparing or you in listening to it. And there's always every week a couple people who listen to the sermon and they pay some of the price so it gets better by the time here on Sunday morning. And Allie Watson, uh, who's there uh, from Asbury, listened to this message and, and she said to me as she was listening to it afterwards, this is really about how we do it versus why we do it. The how we do it can become the idol. The why we do it is staying on the good and beautiful path. How do we put God at the center of who we are, no matter what form that takes? How do we do that? What's at the center of your church, of our church? Is it a particular group of friends? You know, if God is at the center, then your friendship circles, they're porous. They let new people in. If your friends are at the center of your circle, of your church, then when new people come, they don't have any, there's no way to be flexible to open up. What's at the center of your church? I've, uh, I've had the chance to get to know many people from Asbury over the last year or so. Um, worked really closely with the leadership team. I'm so grateful for, for all of you and working with me through this. Um, and this is a time of grieving for folks from Asbury. And I think one of the challenges folks who are from Asbury is letting go of once, what once was. What once was can become an idol. It can become an idol not being open to change for the sake of the mission of Jesus. But on the Sycamore Creek side, um, I think the idol can become that we know it all, that we've got it all figured out. But there's not anything from the culture of, of Asbury, from the things like the copper pot that add to the mission of Jesus here at Sycamore Creek. Our way of doing it can become an idol as well. So what's at the center of your church? Is it your idea of God? Or the God who can't be put in a box? Let's go back to that first commandment. I am Yahweh, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and you shall have no other gods before me. At the center of Sycamore Creek is the rescue mission of God in Jesus Christ. The rescue mission of God through Jesus Christ, to this world. That's what's at the center here. You know, I told you about falling asleep um, and going over those rumble strips when I was a teenager. Um, what I didn't tell you was how I got out of the ditch. Because this was before cell phones, right? Like, I mean, I graduated in 97, 
Actually, my parents did have a cell phone. It was one of those like big boxes that sat in the car and it plugged into the cigarette lighter and I had one of those big, huge antennas that would be a magnet on the top of the car. But, I, I, but you had to be rich to have one of those uh, and I didn't have one as a teenager. So um, I, get, I go off the road, off the highway, and as soon as I get out of the car, immediately there's like two or three cars that saw me go off the road and they stopped on the side of the highway to make sure I was okay. Now, I couldn't get up. I was in a little 79 Horizon, Plymouth Horizon. I wasn't driving back up that embankment. So one of them took me to the next exit and dropped me off at the gas station. Now, again, this is before cell phones. I had to use a pay phone. Do you remember those things? And I had a little AAA card because my dad had bought me a AAA membership. And I called AAA, and they came. They sent a, a truck driver, and... and I had no way to get back to my car, so the truck driver came to the gas station, picked me up, drove me back to the car, hooked a winch on it, and winched me back up the embankment, back over the rumble strips, over the white line, and back onto the good and beautiful path, well, sort of, that 465 is around Indianapolis. And I drove home and opened the door and told my parents, I fell asleep and went off the highway, and there were all these people who helped me. I'm really tired and stressed. I'm going to bed, and I went upstairs. I have no idea what they felt after that, <laughs> other than I'm glad he's alive. But when I think about what's at the center of, the, of Sycamore Creek, it's the rescue mission of God to the world through Jesus, and it's that we would be the person that stops when we see somebody go over the rumble strips and we'd say, are you okay? That we'd be the person who would drive you to the gas station and make sure you get there. That we would be the gas station that has the pay phone that you can call on. That we would be the triple A that would send someone for free to help you get back to your car. That we would be the tow truck that would help winch you back on to the good and the beautiful life. That's the mission of Jesus, the rescue mission of Jesus at Sycamore Creek that is at the center of what we do. That's putting God at the center. No other gods except Yahweh. I'd like to pray that that would be at the center of Sycamore Creek. So as the band comes forward, would you join me in prayer? God, we uh, put so, so many things before you, God. God, we just uh, take a moment here, just in silence, to confess those things that we put before you and lay them at your feet. God, you're a holy God, and you want nothing first except for you. You are the theory of everything. You are the source of all being. You are the ground of our existence. Help us as Sycamore Creek to put you first. In the name of Jesus and only by the power of the Spirit. And all who agreed shouted, Amen. Amen. We're going to sing a song. It's a classic song um, about the God that we put first. Would you stand and join as the band leads us in Holy, Holy, Holy.
all who agreed said amen. amen. Go ahead and grab a seat. There's some things that we would love to connect with you this week. One of them is uh, when you came in, you were handed a program, and in that program is a connection card. And uh, give us your name and email and any other information you're willing to share with us. You'll see lots of other things that you can sign up for on this connection card. If you're watching online, you can fill out the digital connection card at sycamorecreekchurch.org slash connect. And Gretchen is putting that in the comments section. You'll see as well, uh, and, and this is maybe a little bit different uh, for those who are coming from Asbury, is there's a place on here to write your prayer requests. And we have a prayer team that prays through those every week. Know that whatever it is that you bring heavy on your heart today, there's a team of people who are ready to pray for you this week. And midweek, you can always just email prayers at sycamorecreekchurch.org and know that uh, that team will be praying for you. On this as well, the back are some next steps. You know, Jesus said, don't just hear the word, do something about it. And that's one of the biggest mistakes, I think, of church is we think, well, I came and I, I heard, I consumed, but now go and do something. And you'll see, memorize those Ten Commandments, do that, get it in. You know, I love that phrase, learn it by heart, so it gets down in your heart. Read Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. Confess your idols to God and a trusted friend. And then one of the things that we've been trying to do here is to adopt Asbury folks. So Sycamore Creek, uh, if you would like to adopt an Asbury family, write them a note, greet them when they come to church, check that box, and uh, we would love to pair you with somebody from Asbury. It's basically just like a friend to help them be, feel welcome here. Um, if you fill this out for the first time today, we have a free book for you, You'll Get Through This by Max Lucado. We, many of you need that right now. We've all needed it uh, over the last year or so. We're going to be at Woldemar for the next several weeks through July 24th. Um, so come back. Uh, today, after the service, Willie Dees is down there. And we didn't know how many people were going to be here. So I'm pretty sure that it's all you can eat. We ordered plenty, all right? So go down and join us afterwards. Don't run away. Um, Willie Dees, barbecue, everything you can eat down on the back patio. There's picnic tables um, uh, all around and... and just, you'll see it. You'll smell it as soon as you walk out of the building. We are gathering together. Uh, you may, you're like, you may hear me talking about Asbury United Methodist is here. And really Asbury, like, while it, the adoption takes effect today, we're still going to consider Asbury, Asbury until July 31st. And we're going to gather on that day at Asbury United Methodist Church. It'll be the last service of Asbury as Asbury at Asbury. Say that really fast three times. Um, we're going to have a luncheon following. By the way, over the, after today, we invite you to bring a sack lunch and hang out and have some lunch at Woldemar with us each day. Our Potterville campus is collecting items for their back-to-school bash, and you can bring those in here through the month of July. Um, we'll collect them perhaps in the back, and uh, that's a great way for us to serve one of, our, one of our campuses. And you'll see the information there on the screen and in your program. We would love for you to support what we're doing here at Sycamore Creek with your giving. You can do that at sycamorecreekchurch.org slash give. Those blue buckets that are at the end of, of the rows, if you would pick those up if you're at the end of the row and just pass that down the row, put your connection card, put any offering in that blue bucket that you might have. Your offering helps make so many things possible. Last week we gathered here for baptisms. We baptized several people, Gary Bacon, I baptized. That was a real blessing. Uh, Gary, is, Gary is on a journey closer and closer to God. We baptized Madison and her mom, Nicole. She just had an amazing story about bumping into Kathy Doby at Kohl's and then at the grocery store. She's like, why are you following me around? But Kathy wasn't. She did, and she said, well, maybe you're supposed to come to my church. And she did. And then there she was being baptized because of a random encounter. So thank you so much for you're giving. We got one final connection question that I want you to think about. It's, it's 4th of July tomorrow. What's the most beautiful place you've seen or heard fireworks? All right. We're going to stand and join and singing one more song about God. It's, it's the God that is great, the God that should be first. Would you stand and join as the band leads us in this song?
God, you are great. Help us to put your greatness first, not any other substitute greatness. In the name of Jesus and the power of your spirit, and all who agreed said, amen, amen. Where's the most beautiful place you've ever seen fireworks? Uh, as you leave the place today, talk to somebody, turn to somebody, answer that question. For me, I was sailing one time. I had a friend. I joined sailing from northern Michigan to upstate New York. It was a 10-day sail because he was moving, needed to get his boat from northern Michigan to New York. 
And as we were sailing down Lake Huron along the east side of the state, it was on 4th of July, and all of the little towns were shooting off of their fireworks as we were going through. And then later that night, we got the real fireworks. It was a lightning storm that came through while we were sailing down Lake Huron. So we got both uh, human-made fireworks and God-made fireworks that night. It was amazing. Turn to somebody you don't know and answer that question. Hang out next, uh, afterwards, all-you-can-eat, barbecue, amazing Willie D's. Next week, uh, we're back here. We're continuing on in this series, looking at uh, not making any idols. So until then, friends, be curious, be creative, be compassionate, and peace out.